Hey, how's it going out there, folks? Welcome back here to a Monday. Start of the work week is upon us here. Hope, hope everyone's having a good Monday so far. It is 10, 16 a.m. local time here in California, April 21st, 2025. Latest activity here on the Earthquake 3D globe shows a 1.6 into Alaska. Also some movement here across the Japan region. I've seen a, just, we just had a four-pointer show up there on the globe. So a little bit of uptick here across the Japan Trench, also down south here around the Mariana Trench. Obviously, all this activity adding further stress and strain in this area right here, roughly about Taiwan, uh, along this plate boundary into the Nankai Trough. So keep an eye there on the Nankai Trough. I've been chatting about that a lot, but there's obviously some good reason why, good reasons why it can produce some mega quakes. And uh, it's been a little while since we've had activity on that uh, subduction zone. Uh, California, well, the Pacific Northwest, relatively quiet. Nothing showing up here on the map. I'm guessing the USGS has not uh, turned on the preliminary data system up here yet. Um, most of the time during the weekends or during holidays. I don't think today's a holiday. Um, they only report 2.5 and above here for the Pacific Northwest. So nothing showing up on the map due to that reason. Uh, same for Northern California here. Really nothing above or below the 2.5 level. Uh, last night, a three-pointer coming into the area of the Mendocino. Uh, pretty much a triple point boundary up there. San Francisco, pretty quiet still. Not a whole lot popping up there on the, uh, or down there for me anyway, uh, on the uh, plate boundary or any of these other Bay Area faults. Looks pretty quiet out there for now. Um, some further movement along the creeping section of the San Andreas Fault. Uh, some from yesterday, a little bit from today, 1.4 the latest. And Southern California, extreme Southern California here. Got uh, a little bit of clustering going on across the San Jacinto Fault Zone. And the Garlock Fault Shear Zone up here. Still showing some activity with a 1.1 in the last hour. Uh, nothing above 2.5 here for the West Coast, aside from one in Nevada and up in Northern California. So mostly smaller microquake activity out here for now. Uh, some movement there across Malibu area from yesterday. As uh, far as this little swarm area down here, it looks like that came to a halt yesterday, uh, right about um, early after early evening time period. Nothing new to report there for now, but as always, right, got to keep an eye there on Southern California. Uh, Yellowstone National Park up here, nothing showing up um, around the area of Yellowstone. Some movement outside of that area, but I do want to double check here. Let's see if we got anything to chat about there across the Yellowstone. There's not a whole lot as um, far as local activity goes. There's some of the earthquake activity from yesterday. I think that two-pointer um, and a couple other smaller quakes. But as far as local seismic activity, there's you know there's really not a whole lot to chat about there for now. Uh, Texas oil fields and the rest of the southern plains out here, some movement. Very small microquake activity. Nothing big to report. New Madrid seismic zone as well is uh well it's pretty quiet out there so far as newer activity overnight goes uh some movement out in the atlantic ocean with a 5.2 stirring things up out there it's been quite active across this rift boundary recently also some movement down south 5.1 in the south sandwich trench one of the latest earthquakes so a little bit of uh newer movement out there on the globe out in that area of the world as uh, far as the rest of the planet goes here, like I say, we got got to keep an eye here on the Nankai Trough. It's got some interesting movement around it. Obviously, the general plate movement out here, right? If you think about the Filipino plate here in a kind of a, I don't know, is that a burnt red or medium to dark red color right here? At least on my end. Um, the general plate movement here of that uh, plate moves to the northwest along with reinforcing force with the Pacific plate, right? Kind of just moving that Filipino plate in the uh, northwest, westward direction. That, of course, means it's putting strain up here across the Taiwan area, uh, north, northeastward towards the Nankai Trough. So that's definitely um, something to keep an eye on here with this newer movement happening around it and this deeper activity as well. Nankai Trough, keep, keep an eye on it, folks. Uh, some further clustering going on here around the Papua New Guinea area. Got uh, some larger activity yesterday, followed up by some newer quake movement there. Notice those rings in that area raised well off the globe, indicating some deeper activity. Uh, USGS only showing a fraction of the earthquakes out here, but there's a uh, pretty good cluster going on there. 
Uh, some newer activity south of Taiwan, it looks like, a 3.4. Notice that uh, newer quake there. That's, again, that's just reaffirming the, um, the plate movement out here and the strain that's being produced across this area. Uh, let's see what else we got. New Zealand, uh, a couple threes down there. Nothing big to report. Further deep activity across the Tonga Trench there with a 4.4. And uh, let's see what else we have out here across the area. Uh, I think that's a bit about it for now, folks. I do want to show you guys Hawaii. Check this out real quick. Uh, the big island of Hawaii, Kilauea Volcano, has yet to erupt. Unless, I mean, I just checked this a few minutes ago. So let me see what it looks like up at the summit area. Uh, still smoking <laughs> got volcanic gases out there obviously right but no signs of an eruption there was a short-lived eruption yesterday from one of the vents out there but man if you look at the deformation data we are just going up and up and up this is the past month here if you've been following the Kilauea volcano eruptions they've been almost a rinse and repeat cycle with I think we're on episode 18 now you can see it very clearly here Kind of started back in uh, January of this year. Uh, it goes up, down, up, down, up, down for 16, 17, 18 times here. Uh, but this time, this last pause in the eruption, we've gained a whole bunch of volume of magma underneath the area. Uh, so considerably longer time, uh, longer duration of time there from the pause to our soon-to-be eruption here at Kilauea Volcano. So that tells me right there that uh, even though, you know, if this was just kind of going up and then leveling off, that would tell me that the volume of input from below is uh, dwindling, right? But it's not. We're just going up and up and up along with the longer duration. That tells me that there's some maybe some blockage going on down there across one of the one or both of the vents there at the Kilauea summit area. So. With that being said, we could see, you know, we're almost at a double level as far as time observance goes from our last eruption. We could see a, a more um, bigger fountaining type event take place here, more explosive type event there across the summit area uh, with our next eruption. Or it could migrate somewhere else, maybe to a new fracture or a new fissure there at the lava lake area of Kilauea Volcano, away from the crater area right now. So we'll watch that closely. Um, it could go at any time, but um, yeah, rather interesting to say the least. So this is definitely a long duration event far as accumulation of magma uh, prior to uh, any eruption. So we'll keep an eye on that, see uh, how that works out. Also some interesting space weather activity here coming in right now. Massive coronal hole that's been facing us, number 34, is... Uh, well, a portion of it is still facing us and also another area back here. So that is why we are looking at almost, I mean, that's a decent amount of, um, of uh, storming coming up here. Not thunderstorms, but space weather storming. Uh, could see G2 class storms here over the next couple nights. Uh, potentially beginning tonight, looks like maybe tomorrow night will be the main, one of the main uh, events there, but this only shows uh, KP index up around five, uh, but we could be above that. And of course, that is um, uh, great for you know Aurora watchers. Uh, looks like let me go to the real time solar wind stream. Uh, it looks like earlier this morning, uh, the arrival of the high speed solar wind stream reached the planet. This is high, you know, real time solar wind stream. Uh, went from about 400 km a second all the way up to, uh, well, above 700. But um, I still have yet to see any positive effects. Let's go back here uh, to the Aurora activity. So that tells me right there that the BTBZ component of the interplanetary magnetic field is north of this line here. If you want the Auroras to be... Um, you know, spectacular in nature uh, and, you know, as far as amplification of the high-speed solar wind stream and the effects there, the aurora activity uh, in the magnet magnetosphere, you want all these little dots here, these runtime dots below this line. You don't want it north because that tends to suppress the, uh, the, effect, the effects there 
of the high-speed solar wind stream. So even though we have it, uh, it's kind of bouncing back and forth here, a little bit south, but mostly north. So we'll have to wait for this to open up. And there's a very decent explanation here of what the BTBZ component is all about. Uh, the strength of the interplanetary magnetic field is given a value called BT. Now the BZ component is the uh, north-south direction of the interplanetary magnetic field. And that plays a big part on whether uh, that allows a rift to open and solar wind stream to pour into our magnetosphere, which would result in, of course, aurora activity. Right now, as you can see, 5.64 NT north. Uh, we don't want that. We want it pointing south if you want that uh, aurora activity to come in. So right now, north, um, not, not a solid north, but uh, enough to suppress the uh, high-speed solar wind stream, which is currently um, passing the planet. But uh, should that uh, open up and uh, point south, and we could see G2 storms, or maybe even potentially a little bit higher here over the next couple nights. So just keep an eye on that. Uh, you know, there's many different things you can look at in terms of whether it's pointing north or south. This site right here is fairly decent, Aurora Forecast IS. Um, and it just, you know, it shows you right here. It's pointing north and the uh, degree. So neat little simplified explanation there of the BTBZ component. Uh, so we'll watch for that. No major solar flares. And again, that's a result of a massive coronal hole that's been facing us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a big one. Definitely visible here as well. So let's talk about solar flaring activity or lack thereof. Uh, we do have a number of sunspots out there on the eastern limb coming around the bend, so to speak. Um, but uh, goodness, it almost looks like even these newer ones are just uh, fizzling out as they face the planet. Even these uh, currently Earth facing, almost directly facing Earth, these are all pretty much clear cut. Uh, very low-grade sunspots, not capable of producing any stronger flares. So really, right now, um, I'm not seeing anything here. I had my hopes up here across the uh, eastern side of the sun, but I, I'm starting to think I was wrong on that. There's still a number of sunspots way back over there. Let's check out the far side watch, which was put out like two days ago, so that's not going to help us not going to help us whatsoever um, so we'll just kind of keep an eye on things um, I'm issuing a 1% chance or less for X flares uh, M flare probably 40 to 50% chance that's I don't know I don't even know if any of these are capable of producing any M flares like I say there's if you had had a solar telescope solar camera right um, there's some decent sized sunspots out here, but far as complexity, far as the magnetic structure, they're all fairly stable. And that's what you don't want. Uh, these are all beta class structures, it looks like, except for uh, the beta gamma 4062, which is in decline. That is this area right here. Just it was a massive area, but really never showed any signs of complexity. So, not a, you know, there's lots of sunspots, but. They're not doing anything because they're not dynamically set up. So watch for the auroras, though, over the next couple nights here. Looks like we have a decent chance. Uh, severe weather outlook here. Let's take a look. Not a whole lot going on here today. Marginal risk for some severe weather across portions of the south and up around the Great Lakes. Got a little bitty 2% chance up there around Ohio and Pennsylvania as well. Wind and uh, maybe a little bit of hell threats in these areas in the 5%, but that's about it. Not a whole lot going on for severe weather. Uh, but that's probably going to change here soon, it looks like, as we get a return of some, uh, some decent moisture there coming up out of Mexico into the southern Plains states that will be tapping in to a low-pressure system up north and bring in with it the severe weather potential. This is for the week of the 28th of April to the fourth first week there of May, uh, showing some decent signs of severe weather, supercell composite parameters, maybe uh, returns for some tornado activity in the area. So we'll have to watch that. 
Uh, here's the weather forecast model. It looks like things start to ramp up right about here. Uh, this is about midweek, Tuesday night into Wednesday, and then it just amplifies across the area. Um, a lot of moisture coming to Nebraska and Kansas, so if you guys are waiting on the rain, it is coming, let me tell you. I know that area is in uh, some pretty dry conditions right now. Let's check out the drought map across this area. Drought monitoring. Yeah, a lot of uh, Nebraska, western Kansas, this whole area though. Uh, Wow, even look at California. We're starting to seep back in there a little bit to the drought conditions. Uh, but our wet season's over, so that's only going to get worse. But for the folks out here across Southern Plains, Northern Plains, uh, their wet season is coming up, right? Springtime, summer thunderstorms. Uh, I think we'll see a, a decent improvement out here across Western Kansas and then into a good portion of Nebraska as we get uh, a little bit down the road. Right? I want to show you guys how much precipitation these guys are expecting here, uh, which is a decent amount. So we'll run this model run all the way to the 5th of May. Take a look at that. Some decent precipitation returning to these areas that, well, they're counting on it, right? A lot of crops out there. They need uh, some rainfall. And uh, it's coming. This week into the um, first week of May look quite wet out here. Uh, so there's some decent uh, accumulation rates. So it's coming. Got some rain. California, this is very typical for us for this time of year. Just dry. Me, the, the, the weather tracks out here, out here, excuse me, shifts much further to the north. High pressure, and then that brings down the colder air uh, and interacts with the, uh, you know, the warm, moist air down here. It's just typical springtime setup right now. Uh, of course, the severe weather comes along with it as well. That's that's the unfortunate thing, but uh, we do have a bunch of rain coming out there for our much-needed farmers in Kansas, Nebraska area. Texas and Oklahoma getting in there as well. All right, uh, what else we got? I think that's about it. Seismograph stations out there look pretty quiet now across the board, just for now. All right, doesn't mean that it's always going to stay that way. Uh, I think the largest earthquake is going to be that South Sandwich... Uh, maybe not. 5.4 earthquake Indonesia, but that's from yesterday. So today, going to be one out in the Atlantic Ocean, out there in the uh, the rift boundary. Things have been getting going out here. Uh, whenever we see earthquake activity out here, it normally leads to some elevated movement around the planet. But also at the same time, a lot of talk of this boy, this, ba this bad, huge coronal hole facing us, right? That... Uh, Will it stir up earthquake activity? I guess we'll see. Yeah, I've been trying to keep a track of uh, the relationship between the two. The theory here that space weather activity directly affects earthquakes and elevated larger movement. Um, going to probably study this for a couple years and see how the numbers look. I mean, we've gone back in time and looked at numbers as well. And... You know, there's there's some type of relationship between them, but it's not all the time. And sometimes it, it almost appears as though when we get hit with protons, elevated protons there from the sun, that's when things stir up in the earthquake department. Not necessarily because of a solar flare or a coronal hole or or seeing, you know, the effects of a, a CME uh, like we've seen back in May of last year. You know, we had a KP index up around 8 or 9, I think. G5 class storm, I've seen auroras down here in Northern California. I think it was last year, the year before. Uh, we've had a couple interesting events out here, but earthquake activity was just as quiet. It was quiet for days uh, and really no elevated activity following all that excitement from the sun. So we'll see what this coronal hole does. We're already getting the effects of it. Um, you know, the high speed solar wind stream is here. Uh, so we'll take a look, uh, watch these maps here over the next couple days, see if things don't kick up. Right now, though, this is a perfectly normal for any given day of earthquake activity out here. All right, have a good Monday. Enjoy. Uh, we'll be out here just kind of monitoring things. Must be 87 degrees here in Northern California today, so, yeah, I guess I'll take it. Not quite 90, but it's going to be here soon. Have a good one. We'll see you guys out here a little bit later on this evening.